Yes, hello, and uh, welcome to this uh, live stream where I will be continuing my efforts to solve this uh, Crack Me Challenge by uh, Satan or uh, Antonio Parata. Um, yeah, please uh, let me know if the sound is all right. So on. I, I added a little bit of uh, uh, noise reduc reduction to the uh, audio, so please let me know if that sounds all right, otherwise I'll just uh, revert to what I was doing uh, before. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, start by just doing a little bit of a recap of uh, uh, where we are at in this problem and, and, and what the strategy going forward uh, will be. So uh, as I said, this is a Crack Me uh, created by Antonio. It's available on GitHub. And let me just zoom in a little bit. And what we're given in this uh, challenge is a, a description here that it, uh, the binary contains some tricks with some revivals from old school era. I wrote it in assembly. I will publish the source code in about a month. Uh, if you find it interesting, you want to write a tutorial, I'll be happy to add a link to the tutorial in this page. Um, yeah, and I guess that's kind of what we're doing here, uh, trying to solve it. Um, so we downloaded this and the challenge came in the form of this uh, exe file, uh, satanic code.exe. And let's open the IDA project as well, so we can see how far we are in this. Um, mm -mm. So yeah, so just to recap uh, what was going on, um, we have this binary and it will ask for an ID and it will ask for a license key. And then it will do some stuff, including trying to validate this license. And then it would it will either say that it's invalid or it will do something if it is valid. And then it will exit. And we looked at this and we saw a few interesting things that it's doing. So the uh, first thing it is doing, it's making the whole uh, text segment uh, writable so that it can modify itself. Then it will find these uh, markers in the code, which we should be able to navigate to. Yes, so you have here these... Uh, um, I think let's change this to, yeah, so here we have these four markers at the start of this block. And then at the end here, we have these four markers, which I think it's the same four markers, but in a, in a, in a different uh, order. So we just wrote a little script to replicate this uh, to make sure that we can actually find those markers as well. Um, okay, so that's one part that the code is doing. And then it will um, it will Hello, chat. Yeah, so the question is, if uh, is it just starting? Yes, I'm just starting. I'm basically just uh, doing a recap of uh, how far uh, I got uh, last time. Uh, oh, by the way, if you have any uh, questions or comments or any anything, um, you know, throughout this, just put it in the chat. But please do not uh, give any spoilers, like if you know the solution to this, because like the point of this stream is not just to show the solution, because if that would have been the point, I could like solve this off screen and just done like a short recap of how to solve this. The point is to show the 
process, like how you would approach something like this and how you would uh, solve it. Uh, so the idea is that I do not know the solution to this. Uh, but I did, this is the second uh, part. I did a uh, first part of this where I did uh, the, some uh, reversing, but I didn't finish. So uh, hopefully I should be able to finish uh, this time. Anyway, so it will uh, it will set the code the writable. It will find these markers. It will set up a uh, structured uh, exception handler. The uh, question is, is the challenge publicly available? Yes. So if you either go to... Um, Satan's uh, Twitter at S4TAN uh, there's a link there or github um, slash encomio slash satanic code with lead speak uh, you will find the challenge uh, there so after it has uh, find, found these markers it will set up this structured exception handler and then it will here it will modify the e flag so it will change uh, the execution to into single step mode. So this is the thing that will kind of like drive the the, the main uh, interaction here between um, the structured exception handler and the single step mode. And then it's calling this verify license, which is inside this uh, uh, between these markers. So this is this block of code which is not actually valid code but what happens then is since we are in single step mode it will um raise a debug uh, exception so we would go into this uh, exception handler and here it will decrypt uh, it will decrypt one instruction first of all it will restore if there was, so every time it de decrypts uh, a function, oh, sorry, not a function, it decrypts an instruction and it saves the original uh, ciphertext in a temporary buffer. Uh, so of course, the first time this is called, that temporary buffer will uh, not be empty. So this part is, uh, is uh, skipped. But anyway, if this part, um, the second time this is run, uh, it will first restore the original ciphertext before trying to decrypt the next instruction. This is because the instructions are of variable length. This is x86, so you have variable length instructions. So it doesn't know upfront how long the instruction will be, but it will decrypt 15 bytes um, starting at the current instruction pointer. And this is because So I just want to make sure that I'm saying this correctly. I've, yeah, this is 15. I could be off by one that it could be 16, but I think it's 15 bytes it, it will encrypt. Oh, actually, that makes sense because, yes, because it's storing 15. Oh, yeah, so it will decrypt 15 bytes. So those 15 bytes, since an x86 instruction is at most 15 bytes, so those 15 bytes are guaranteed to include the instruction we are about to execute. But it could also be the case that it includes uh, a bunch of bytes actually belonging to the next instruction, which means that the next time this would have been called, it would like mess up everything. So it will first restore everything back and then decrypt that single uh, instruction. So this will just then, it will decrypt one instruction at a time and uh, restore the previous ciphertext before before moving on, moving on so the issue here is that we can't really or at least i don't know how to uh debug this in a good way um so what we want to do ideally would be to just like either like replicate or emulate this decryption code to just decrypt this whole uh, blob here in in uh, memory and then sorry here this all of this data we would like to decrypt this so that we could just reverse this um statically which would make things uh, much easier so there are a few ways we could do this uh, one way could be to do it uh, completely statically uh, to just look at this decry decryption code 
and see, try to understand how it works and just re-implement it in, in like Python or something. Another thing we could do is we could uh, emulate this. So we would just like take this particular code and we would set up like an emulator and run this. Uh, another way could be to do some kind of tracing. So where we run the program and we trace all reads and writes, and this way we will get all the decrypted instructions that are executed. The downside with like a dynamic approach like that is that if there are branches, uh, so there, there maybe there's some code and there is like, if something, then do this, otherwise this, we will of course only get the decryption of the instructions that are actually um, executed. Uh, so then we would have to like look at all the branches and then um, maybe change our input or something and then do it again to get more instructions and, and so on. So that's the downside of, of something like that. Um, so what I'm going to do now, my approach is going to be uh, first, I'm going to try a little bit uh, doing this completely statically. I'm gonna, we're going to try to look at this code and see what it does. If that's like too complicated or if it doesn't work out, we're going to try to emulate it uh, using uh, like unicorn uh, to, to just emulate the code and just run it on all on all the different instructions to, to decrypt them. Uh, but let's start out with the uh, just looking at and trying to go at this uh, statically. So first, let's look at what we established already uh, the last time, which is the like overall uh, structure of this um, decryption. Uh, there was another question, by the way. When is pony racing coming back? Uh, I don't know. Uh, hopefully, some at some point. Um, that's everything I can can say at, at this at this time. And there was also a suggestion uh, dynamic tracing, maybe. Yeah. So. As, as I said, like I, we could do some kind of tracing. Unfortunately, I'm not at all familiar with uh, like tracing tools. So this is a Windows uh, binary, so I'm not at all familiar with like tracing and stuff on on Windows. I'm not too familiar with like tracing workflows in general. But if you have like suggestions for like tools uh, to look at, uh, that would also be be good. But let's start uh, completely statically. So. What we have established so far is that it will first restore any um, it will restore any uh, previously decrypted data, and then it will decrypt the current uh, instruction if this instruction is within this start and end um, markers. And what does the encryption look like? Sorry, the decryption. So first of all, it will copy, it will take a copy of the the backup, uh, sorry, it will take a copy of the uh, uh, ciphertext the, that it, it's about to decrypt so that it can restore this later. Then it's going to take a copy. I'm not sure why this uh, decompilation here is messed up, but anyway, it's going to copy this table uh, of, this table contains 10 function pointers. Uh, all of these function pointers are pointers to simple functions of, of this uh, format or style. It will do some kind of operation uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, it will take a pointer and then modify, uh, like it will return a modified value uh, from that pointer based on both the pointer like the value at the pointer, but also the pointer itself. So this means that the same instruction will be encrypted into different things depending on where it's located. Uh, so that's an, also an interesting observation. <clears throat> but anyway, it will take a copy of this uh, table and then it will, if I, remember this correctly it would like it will shuffle this table around i think we can see somewhere around yes here so let's see here it 
takes uh, this is a bit uh, so there's a suggestion about using anger that could possibly work as well not sure if we like need that dynamic or sorry the like symbolic execution there or like if it if it would work or not i mean it could could definitely work um so basically what it's doing here is uh, first of all it's getting some kind of index to this function pointer based on the uh, instruction pointer it's getting a pointer to this function table it will take this function pointer and then here it will um let's see it will do something with these things move on to the next pointer and then this is just a, a counter. So, and here is the, um, some kind of uh, um, condition for breaking this loop. And then this is a recursive call, I think. Yes. So, uh, okay, or maybe actually what it's doing here, here it's giving the like start location, um, of the, 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 the location of the starting markers as an argument to this, uh, uh, shuffling function instead. So that's interesting. But anyway, it's it's basically it's it looks like it's basically uh, shuffling these pointers around. Um, and then. After all of that is done, it will loop this thing 15, 15 times, where it will take the current the, the pointer into the, the byte to decrypt, and it will um, it will call this function again. which returns a function pointer and it will call this function pointer uh, with this uh, the pointer to the data and then it will finally write, write the, the result of that back to to that location and then we'll move, move on to the next uh, place. So that's essentially like the high level uh, thing that's going on uh, here so the i think key to this is understanding this function i think um that's and then this thing of course as well Uh, including this uh, very interesting constant here. So, yeah, so this will be a little bit uh, tedious, 
but let's actually start uh, looking at this. So gonna just bring up some notes. And this is what I wrote down uh, from the from the previous um, session. Maybe it should increase the size a little bit more. And there is actually one thing we completely missed here. And I completely forgot in the recap as well. And this is uh, let's see, where was that function? Here, this uh, function. So uh, after finding these markers, but, for, but before setting up the um, exception handlers, we call this function here which performs a nice little trick where, so this is 32-bit uh, code, but what it's doing here is it's, um, it's using this uh, return far thing together with uh, this thing where you push this hex uh, uh, 33 on the stack uh, to switch into 64-bit mode. So this is actually 64-bit code which will run and it's set up in such a way that, let me open the, the Binary Ninja project where we actually looked at this code. Um, this is this address. Let me change to just Oh, the disassembly. So here, it's setting, depending on this byte, which is part of the uh, PEB, and I don't know, I don't know exactly what this is, but basically it will set the, it will XOR the RSI register with either this or this uh, value. And RSI is set here to this address. Um, so this value here will be XORed with either this or this. And we just tried that in, in our code here. And I think we looked at Uh, these are the two results of that, which we don't know yet what this is for because this is actually not referenced anywhere else. Uh, so far, they just, so here they take the value, store it into the uh, ESI register, and then after executing the 64-bit code, it just stores it back into this. So. So far, we don't know what that's for, but uh, it's still good to uh, good to keep in mind. I guess that maybe that's used inside of this code that will be um, um, that will be decrypted. So do XOR the value at this address with either this or this. Uh, we don't know what that is yet. Anyway, back to the decryption. So I would say we should look at this with like a concrete example. What's the first instruction that we do this with? So. Let's look back here. We call the verify license thing, which is this address. So let's just open a more new text file. So like the instruction pointer is this. So, and 
this we also need these uh... oh this is the offset so we have just looked up the offsets in the file but we're gonna need the actual like addresses in memory so the start marker is gonna be at this address and the end marker it's going to be um, the end marker is going to be towards oh, uh, down here, at this address. OK, so they are going to be interesting as well. So the, the first thing we do is we check if the offset, so the instruction pointer minus the address of the start marker is going to be like, this is an expression that's used in, in multiple places here. And this is essentially like the offset inside of this uh, encrypted block. So in our case, actually we're going to open a, uh, the Python prompt here. We can do something like this as well. So um this is the offset and the offset modulo 10 is not zero. So we do this where we take the offset modulo 10, which is two. And here we also do take the offset, divide by 10, multiply by 10. So this is like round down to the nearest 10. So we do this by taking um, this in Python. So this is the offset rounded down, which we would had would have here. And what it's doing now is that okay. So it's gonna uh, count down. It, so this uh, offset modulo ten is the number of times this um, uh, loop will run. So that's why if, if it's already at zero, it will not run at all. So what will it do? It will take this offset rounded down. Here it will count up instead. Uh, so we will call this function with the pointer. And the first time we call it, it is with this value here, the, the rounded down value. And we call directly into this function, which will perform these calculations. So first of all, we check what is this? It's some constant value here, which we have not seen before. First of all, let's actually check uh oh sorry let's just google this value in case this happens to be some known constant uh which it doesn't seem to be um so that's unfortunate um, so this is like constant one, which we don't know what it is. And it will take the value we have, multiply it by this, add this constant, then we don't know what it is, take this value. And then this is, oh, interesting. What's this instruction? Uh, 
oh, this is the number. Okay, this is uh, the like, counting the number of bits. Return the count of number of bits set to one. Um, so, so this is just the like, Hamming uh, weight. The number of bits sets one. And if and here we just check if 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 the last bit of the original value is a one or not, and then depending on so basically is this an odd or even number, and then depending on if it's an odd or even number, we rotate we do a bitwise rotation either right or left uh, with the uh, Hamming weight. And then we take that value modulo 10. So this is some kind of like, like a hash function, uh, basically. Got a hello from Matthias. Hello, Matthias. So basically, this is essentially just like the the, de the details here are not really important, except that we have to re-implement this. But you know, it's fairly straightforward. But the over like overall idea of this function, it's essentially a hash function, like hashing some value down to a value between. Because we take modulo ten here, it will be a value between zero uh, and so a value from zero to nine. Uh, so that's just the the essence of this function. And then. We will use this as an index into this table. We will get the pointer to that location in the table. We will dereference this pointer to get a function pointer. We will also check that this function pointer, uh, if it is a null pointer, which I guess it should not be. Uh, at least as far as we know, but maybe there is something later here, but basically we're just checking if it's a null pointer. Um, and then it, we're also checking that the, um, if the pointer, oh, right here, because we could go off the end, I guess. So, Basically, here, if we um, go off the end of the table, we 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 reset it back to the uh, the first element. So it's like a, a, a cyclic uh, thing here, where we iterate uh, through the table and then we just go back to the beginning if we reach. Because um, and this is important. There is a um, I think. This should be all right. This is a bit misaligned. Uh, so here it says uh, three null bytes, then 10 32 bit values, and then one byte. But this is actually incorrect. It should be we should undefine this, undefine that. We should make it 10 entries and then one null entry. So in our copy of the table, we will always have these 10 entries, which we overwrite and shuffle around and so on. And then there would just be this uh, null value at the end. So let's get back here. And then what we're doing is we're dereferencing the current um, table um, uh, pointer to get one of these function pointers. And then we do a bit test and set. So this is another x86 instruction. So let me check exactly how this one works. Uh, so selects the bit in a bit string specified with the first operand called the bit base at the bit position designated by the bit offset operand second operand stores the value of the bit in the cf flag 
Okay, so we extract one bit and then sets the selected bit in the bit string to one. And there's a bunch of other things going on. So we look at this pointer value and then we set one of the bits in this pointer but I need to check how this should be interpreted. Is this like, it should not be the 255th bit. That doesn't really make sense. Well, we need to double check that. But anyway, um, this is the bit that we get. And if this bit is zero, we will break. And then it will write that pointer back and it will increment the to go to the next element in the pointer and then we will return this if we break we return this uh, value but we uh, mask it out like this okay so what i think is happening here but we need to double check this is that it's using like the because so these pointers, they are 32-bit values, but we don't need, like based on how the, the memory layout works, some of these bits will always be zero. So they're not really relevant to the pointer value uh, really. So I think they're using this to setting some bit. And then at the end here, they're masking those bits out when it's returning the function pointer to be used as a pointer. So it's kind of using these values as a combination of a function pointer and some kind of flag bit. Um, so I'm just not sure how to interpret this. thing here. Oh, wait, here it's doing a conditional move here as well. Is, are these, these, uh... okay, that's the, the, the previous stuff. Um, Yeah, so the part I'm a little bit um, confused about is that why is this 255? I would imagine that since we are working with 32-bit values, this would be a value between 0 and, and 31. But maybe it's like a different way of, of, of writing it. So I need to double check this. But Essentially, what we're doing is we're just going through the table until we find a function that's not, that doesn't have this bit set. Um, so maybe it's actually not shuffling things around as I was first suggesting. Um, should change this to pointer. Um, so maybe this is just to like not reuse, but what then what happens? Uh, so. It will do this 10 times, which is to go through the whole table. But if it, if this go down, goes down to zero, it will call this setup function table, which copies it again, and then performs this. All right, so actually, 
is this preserved between calls? Oh, okay, so we're just actually... Now I think I see what it's doing. So when we do this initial setup here, we take a copy of this function table, and of course all of these bits will be... these marker bits will be zero. Then, basically, this would then be like uh, get unmarked or... yeah, unmarked function. So this this uh, function ba basically plays two roles. It will it will fetch a function from the function. It will fetch the first unmarked function from the function table and also mark it as used or something. Or and then if it goes through the whole table without being able to find such a function, it will kind of um, reset. Uh, the function table and using this pointer and do it again. So what we're doing here, we are setting up the function table and marking a couple of the functions based on this initial value. We'll mark a, a few of these as used and then we'll go into this decryption loop where we will start fetching these functions one at a time, using them to decrypt the value, and then um, marking that function pointer as used, and going on to the next value. And then when we have used all the functions, we will just reset the table and keep going. So I think that's essentially what the function, uh, this whole thing is doing. And that doesn't sound too complicated, so we should be able to implement this. Um, so let's see. We will need we will need all of these like decryption functions. So here in the um, here they're taking a pointer but we will do this in python so we will probably just give them like the data and an offset but we also need to translate between like the offset on disk versus the virtual uh, address so let's look at this um we we should define these functions um so actually probably don't need to have the whole name. It's not really relevant. We'll just call them like decrypt one, two, three, and so on. And then we'll take, they will take the data and the offset. And that's it. And they will return. Um, so first of all, the uh, pointer will be the offset plus some uh, it will be the, the, the address of this magic start, which we already have here. Uh, magic start virtual address, magic end virtual address. Um, and then we should subtract the, the offset in the file. So this will give us, um, this will convert from like an offset on disk to a pointer in memory. And then in this case, for example, it will take 
the data at this offset, this byte, and it will XOR it with this. So in this specific case, it actually didn't use the pointer value. Maybe we should do this outside and so we should actually just call this like address and virtual address, I think is a better, or no, actually, I think offset is a good name here. So this should be done outside, but let's just put a comment there. We can just return this value. Okay, so now We'll just save this as comment. So now we kind of just have to do this for all of these 10 different functions. Now, of course, the implementation needs to be changed for them, but uh, we'll do that later. And then we have this um, like decryption table which will have all of these uh, functions. And, but actually we need to keep track of whether they have been used or not. So let's make this a, a Dictionary So we have this and then we should um look at this yeah we should actually just implement all these uh, functions so yeah i'm sorry for the slightly boring so here we just do um we add 86 so this this part is going to be a little bit boring uh but yeah that's what it is here we oh yeah we should have so there, we need uh, some Python functions for doing these like bitwise rotations. I have this saved, yes. This is very nice. So just some utility functions. I should put them in some like um, library or something that I have locally. I just copy them from this Python disk or GitHub disk every time. Um, anyway, we were at function number three. So we rotate the value two steps to the right and then add 66. So we take the value and we rotate the value and it's we rotate it two steps and it's an 8-bit value then we add 66 and then we do the value XOR with a pointer And here, number five, we do the value minus the pointer. And here we do the value plus the pointer. And then number seven. Um, number seven, we take, we rotate left four steps, this value. So rotate left four steps, eight bit value. And then we do, we take the not of that. Um, <clears throat> and then 
here is the bitwise not of the value x sword with x17 so this sort of this yes and then here the bitwise not of the pointer x sword with the bitwise not of the value so something like this and then here we rotate left six steps then rotate this <laughs> okay rotate left six steps on an 8-bit value uh, and then the bitwise not of that and then we xor with the bitwise not of rotating uh sorry rotating right oh this is a mistake this should be the pointer and here we should rotate right the value yes three steps <clears throat> okay so those except that we didn't put in a as an argument here so those should be our 10 different uh, functions and this is our decryption table and uh, now we should go to the uh, set this thing up so it looks to me Oh, we should implement this uh, this hash function as well. We need to implement that. Uh, we just call it hash one, this value, and what is it doing? Uh, so it takes this constant. And then it multiplies the value. Okay, so and then it will do <clears throat> count the hamming weight, which you can just simply do something like this while x. Add one to the result and then shift. Uh, sorry. If so, if the if the least significant bit is set, we add one to the counter. We shift it down one, and then at the end we return the result. And we can just add a quick test to this. do something like this just make sure that it works um so b2 is the hamming weight of b1 and then if the value uh, if the least significant bit is not zero we do we rotate the right, uh, we rotate V1, V2 number of steps, and it's a one byte thing. Um. Oh, this is I should actually change the type here to make it more clear. Or no, it's actually okay. So just need to make sure here that the like <clears throat> the sizes of things are correct. So they take the full 32 bit value here, but they use only the 
the one byte value here. So we should do here, we should do this to just take the least significant byte of this. And then it takes the hamming weight of the whole thing, good. And then it just checks, well, the least significant bit is the same either way. And it still rotates. Okay, so here we go back to using just the one byte. So this should be like this, rotated this many steps. I, otherwise we do a rotate left. And then finally we return this modular 10. Now we don't really have a good uh, test value here, uh, but um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, to verify that these things make sense uh, later, but it, it feels like it should work. <clears throat> okay, so now we want to implement this. And actually, we want to make sure that the order is properly maintained here. So we should actually not use a dictionary like this because we are not sure that the order here is properly maintained. So instead, we should just like do this as um, like a list of tuples, I think. Uh, or actually, since we want to be able to modify this, we should make it a list of lists. Um, so now we want to do... Uh, all right. Actually, we want to be able to quickly create like a fresh copy of this. So I think we should actually just have the functions in in a list and then we will have a function to create one of these uh, lists that we will actually operate on so like uh, create a function table and this will just return a um, it will return a list of lists So here we have kind of our like template, which is a list of these 10 functions. And then we have this function to create a new list where each element is a list containing the function pointer and an entry false because we haven't used the function yet. So this is what happens. This is like the equivalent of this part here. <clears throat> so now we need to create this function like set up function table where we call this function to create this function table and then uh, we should have the um, okay we can call it like the pointer and then yeah, we'll basically just implement this. So, I mean, it, it might feel a little bit unnecessary to just like basically, we're basically just re-implementing the C code in Python. And uh, like, you could probably just, as I said, one other way would have been to like emulate it or like call directly into the um, uh, code itself. But I mean, this also like really helps understanding what it's doing. And it I feel it's easier once you kind of like get through some of these um, initial stuff it will be much easier to just like iterate uh, on this so um we create this um so can we work with just the offs since we
we should probably work with the proper virtual addresses here. So we do, we can actually call this the virtual address. <clears throat> so the, the first thing we, we do is to get the offset by taking the virtual address minus the uh, magic start virtual address. <clears throat> oh, and this is actually really nice because this means that, so look here, like here in this inner loop here, when they call the setup function table with this start pointer, this will be zero here. So it will skip this whole thing. So it's basically just setting up a fresh unused uh, function uh, table. So that makes a perfect sense. So that's also a good, like, that feels consistent. Um, well, I guess we could just basically implement this now. So offset mod 10 is just this and then the offset round 10 is just 10 times the offset divided by 10 and note that this is python 3 so the <clears throat> uh, double slash is a uh, integer division uh, a single slash would give us a floating uh, point value which we do not want so here we can flip this around. Uh, basically, here it says while this is not one, but we could switch it to a while loop and saying while this is not zero, I think. So, uh, so just sim I think we could just simplify this. Um, this one will just keep counting up. And this is just counting down. So we can skip this whole intermediate variable and then just do while this thing is more than zero. And then we do uh, get unused function of this thing. And then we just add one to this. This function is not implemented yet. Whoa, sorry. Um, so this will take a, we will pass this as an argument instead of using uh, a global variable. So this does not, nothing in the meanwhile. Um, Or should we really call this an offset? I think it's better to just call it like a seed value. Um, so this should implement this function. <clears throat> and now we do this get unmarked function or unused function. So we get the uh, function index by calling the hash, hash one on this seed value. And then, um, yeah, so basically what we just do is we just iterate through the table <clears throat> to find the first unused function starting at this offset. And if we go all the way around uh, and we don't find one, then we just like refresh the table and that will, that will just get the first, uh, uh, that will just give us the first entry let's see yes that will give us the first entry which actually no sorry it will not give us the first entry it will give us that um the entry the the, the initial uh, entry because so we'll just keep looping <clears throat> essentially um so What we could then just do is because either there are two cases, either all the functions are used 
or at least one function is not used. So what we can just do is we can start, instead of doing it like this, uh, where we try 10 times, we can just start by checking, are all the functions used? If they are, we refresh the table. And then we're guaranteed to be in the state <clears throat> there is at least one <clears throat> function that we want. So would that, would that be correct? Um, Yes, I think so. We'll go exactly one lap round. Yeah. So we will check if um, so we take this function table take every element, split it up into the function and the used value, and just check, uh, and just extract this value and check like if all of them are true, then we are in this case, everything is used. And then we just recreate the uh, function table. And then down here, we're now, now going to be guaranteed to be um, in this uh, situation where we have at least one that's not used. So uh where as long as this uh, sorry um we can just so we say that while this second entry is true we keep doing this loop which will be just incrementing this thing so when we get here, the function index will be pointing to a um, function pointer which has not been used yet. And then we can return this. I think that's correct. Oh, and also, of course, we also then need to uh, mark this as being used and then we return this so that should be the correct implementation now of course there might be a, a bunch of bugs in here but anyway um so this should implement this uh let's back up that would be the whole table in this initialization thing uh, sorry, I can't pronounce that properly today. Um, and now we should just do the decryption, which is just get the next unmarked function and call that function and write those bytes. Makes sense. Um, so actually, let's move these things back up to the top here. So now we're going to create this kind of like loop where the actual action happens. So we have this like entry point, which is here, where we call the verify license thing. And this is uh, the entry point virtual address. We have the whole exe data extracted, yes. Um, oh, right, because this is the thing, right? Because we can't just necessarily just start from the top of this block and decrypt them because we don't know how the instructions are aligned. But I think as a, as a very first thing, we're going to try to decrypt the, the instruction at this location and just see if this makes sense. So before we set up this like thing to like decrypt everything. So um, we're going to start by creating this, uh, our uh, function table.
sorry, we this this is the function we call we're calling. We do this setup function table with this virtual address of the uh, uh, this thing here, and of course we also actually need to return the function table from this function here when we have like done this initial modification. So first of all, we could just print this and see if this uh, corresponds to the like manual example that we worked through previously. Okay, that seemed to be entering in some kind of uh, in loop I guess so uh, something something was get unused function uh, So we can just print this. Oh, we don't, we don't, we never decrement this uh, value here. So of course this will never finish. Right, that makes much more sense. Um, and actually you see the first time here, it's actually called, oh wait, it's called twice. That's interesting. Oh no, that does, does it, it makes sense. Oh, this is misspelled. So it should be called Uh, let's think about this again. When we do the setup, this first value is a two, which was what we, uh, when we worked through this manually, that's what we got here. Uh, but this should then, so that would be, so this would be two. And then this would be two, and then it's one. Okay, I think we are having off by one here in the loop. This should be, if it's zero, that's also fine then. Now we call it twice, that makes sense. Uh, and then the first time it would be called It would get the um, the rounded down value, which would be this, and then the second time it would be that plus one. So actually, we can just print this um, these two values together. Okay, so that 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 makes sense. So it looks fine. So we should be able to then use this to do the decryption. So now we just get keep getting functions based on the pointer value and then we decrypt them. So we're just going to do this a bit quick and dirty first and then we kind of like refactor this into a nice um thing that will do this more generally. So um, let's get rid of that temporarily. So we have the entry point virtual address. And then we can do uh, let's create a function to just decrypt one byte then decrypt byte, which should get the data and the virtual address. And then here we will calculate the offset of this data. We take the virtual address, we subtract the 
magic start virtual address and then we add the magic start offset in the file so let's think about why this works so let's say that this was actually Hmm. let's say somewhere here let's say like 10 bytes in here so we take the virtual address uh, somewhere around here let's say it's like something c9 and then we subtract this virtual address we will get the offset from here to here <clears throat> and so that's in something like 10 or something and then we add the file offset uh, where this is so then we will get the file offset in this location uh, so that's the uh, offset for this, and that means that we can get, uh, and then the uh, decryption function will be, oh, we need to pass around this uh, function table uh, as well. So we will get the unused function uh, from the function table, and then we will use the virtual address as a seed, and then we will call this decryption function with the data array, the offset, and the virtual address. And this is the new value. So then we can just say that the data at the O, actually, we shouldn't be modifying uh, the original array at all. We should just be returning the decrypted value. So now what we will do uh, is that we will just decrypt the bytes. will just simply be that we call a decrypt byte using the function table, this exe data, and the virtual address or virtual address in range starting at the entry point and then going... Uh, Uh, up uh, 15 bytes. This is an uh, exclusive uh, at the, uh, the end of this. And then we can just, first of all, we'll just print uh, actually there was, will be and then we'll just print those. I did something wrong. Oh, this is, uh, sorry, I've been using the wrong variable. This is the magic start markers. We are looking for the actual uh, offset start. So that's the value we're looking for. Oh, and then we need to actually, when we um, get the value here, I wasn't careful uh, here to make sure that like we're actually wrapping around and just keeping a single byte. So let's do this outside. So outside here, we mask this out to just get the uh, one byte from this. Um, and then oh, this is the sorry, wrong function. This is what I was trying to do. Okay, that's a result. Now we have no idea if this is a sensible result or not. Um, the way we would like to know, or like the way we can figure that out is to, um, we could just try to disassemble those bytes. So you can use something like this. You can, there's also like command line tools for this, but this is also like a quick way to do it. So this thing says that this like 7F17 uh, corresponds to like uh, some kind of jump, which, and then you look at the other stuff and it doesn't, 
It doesn't really look correct, I think. Um, it, it's, I would expect something like, assuming this is like a regular um, function entry point, you would expect some like function preamble or something, um, you know, something like pushing push EBP or it's like something uh, modifying the stack pointer or the base pointer or stack pointer and stuff like that. So I think this is incorrect. The question is like, how, what now? How do we do this? We couldn't, there wasn't like a good way of uh, uh, debugging this uh, uh, as far as we know. So first of all, let's just start by cons like looking through the code and see if there's anything that we do that's incorrect. Um, So this is a bit interesting. So when we call the decrypt instruction, It uses the instruction pointer here, which will be used as the pointer here. But when we set up the set up set this up initially, it uses the offset as a seed. Um, so first, yeah, hello, superhero as well. And it was a question, why, what makes you think that debugging is not the way to go? Yeah, so I can actually show that there was, I had some issues. So let's actually start up the virtual machine. Um, so this might be just me that's not like doing something wrong, but I had, uh, I had an issue where it wouldn't like actually go to my exception handler. Oh, nice Windows updates on my virtual machine. But let's let's take another stab at at the uh, at the debugging aspect as well, and let's just make sure that maybe we just need to change some some um, some flags in the debugger to make it actually go to the uh, exception handler. And uh, yeah, I should be able to do that. That would be great because then we could just like validate it against like the first uh, um, the first value and then we have all this uh, scripting set up and then we can just do it decrypt uh, stuff so let's open up x32 uh, debug and I think this was the last thing I ran So it's a question of like some anti-debugging techniques going on. No, there is no there's no uh, anti-debugging uh, per se. It's just that the whole the, like the whole execution mechanism is oh no, I need to disable Windows Defender again. Um so um the whole execution mechanism is based on uh, debugging. So let's see if we can go to this breakpoint. Um, so let's. So now it's running. Enter your ID, license key, and now we're here. And now we're in the single step mode. So the question is, how do I, it should be able to, um, so basically what I wanted to do is, 
I wanted to run it to this uh, structured uh, exception handlers. So actually, maybe we can just Google this. Uh, X64 debug, uh, debug, SEH, dealing with uh, so they explain this exception handle, exception list. So this seems like a similar scenario. Hmm. No, that's not really what we're looking for. Uh, so we want to no wait are we at the correct place now so this exception handler is at this DD8. Oh, that's <clears throat> that's where we are. Okay, so why did that work this time? Interesting. But no, actually, this did happen last time, but now we're no longer in the correct place. This will just... Or is it? So we want it to go into No, exactly. This goes down here now. So yeah, that's now that's not not correct. Um Pass exceptions. What well, these I think are the things we want to do. So actually, let's restart this. Go to the entry point. And let it run. ID. And then what do we do here? We could do, is it pass ex exception? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So and then we could just do F9, and then that would be, so debug, whoa, okay. It's shift F9 and shift F7 would be, and now we are inside this thing. Actually, I noticed one thing actually that's that's probably a cause of this, and that's um, when we turn on the uh, single step mode, the first call to the exception handler is actually not this uh, it not the verify licensing, but instead it will be here. Like this one. So that means the table will be modified once first, and then this will happen. 
but now we should then actually have a way to like uh, work with this. I think let's just verify this. We step through the exception. Yes, so the this code is correct, and now or no. Uh, so I'm mistaken. This is move EAX into one. Oh no, the exception code was not correct then. So EBX, let's look at this value. C O O O O O five, which is not correct, but actually we should also search for this. What would this be? Um to O five application error, access violation. Um, so this is the exception code. Should also look for if we let this continue. Hmm, no, we, now we have this bad behavior again. Let, maybe let's actually see if it was that we screwed something up. Um, so we should do here a run exception and let's see what's uh, this EBX is Okay, now it's correct. So now this will, okay, so we should be able to follow this now at the first. So now it will go into the right place. So now it's here, it's gonna go into the restore encrypted code thing, but we know that this part is actually not interesting. So we'll just step over it. And then it's stepping into this thing here where it's gonna do the decrypt uh, code thing but this should not work or like it should not do anything since yeah since we are outside the range so it will go back here and then it will just uh, return And yeah, and now we're back here. So next thing, it will go to this again, end up in this exception handler. But now we get this issue again. Yeah, so there is something that we're doing here which causes this to mess up. And I'm not completely sure what, what or why. Uh, so I think we'll leave this for now and just look at the uh, code again, see what, I mean, that would be very good if that worked. And I think it's just something about like, like putting the right um, stuff in the, the uh, debugger but uh, I'm going to go with this instead. Um, but actually, this uh, tells us something that the thing I was uh, was concerned about is not going to be an issue. I was concerned that the, the table was going to be manipulated because of those two single steps um, 
before, but that's not an issue because you have this check that it's in the range. So the first address will indeed be this uh, address that we were looking at. So there's something else uh, wrong. So what would that be then? We have the decrypt instruction thing. So um So what could be the issue here? It could be that we're calculating this this uh, hash value incorrectly, though I don't think so, but let's look at it. So the hash value, we're taking this constant here. Uh, and then we're... multiplying with this value, but just taking one byte here. Then we calculate the Hamming weight of this. And then if the least significant bit of the value is not zero, then we rotate right. And Yes, we take just the last bit, we rotate right this many steps. Otherwise we rotate left that many steps, and then we return this uh, modulo 10. So that's that all seems fine. So could it be this uh, initial shuffling here that we are like off by one? So as I said in our manual calculations over here we are at 7000 17400 and oh wait I'm forgetting this. I'm not adding back, I think. Let's see here. No, yes, I'm not adding back the uh, the start uh, offset. And this is why there's this, there was this, this discrepancy, why there's like an offset here, but like an address here. So that's the reason, well, at, that's the, at least one issue. So we should add back this um, offset here. So this is actually not an offset. This is like a virtual address rounded down. So if we run this, we get a completely different uh, sequence of bytes. That makes sense. Um, still doesn't really look like it's correct but that's something um i wonder if we could set the breakpoint just in that position and then like let it run and skip the other breakpoints we can try um so we would set like a breakpoint here and then or set the breakpoint here. We would like restart at this, uh, and then we would do 
like run pass exceptions. And now we are here. So this would be ECX um sorry where am i uh b7 oh we're down here but still ecx should have this should be six that's interesting why is this the argument that should be on the stack Four o. So that's the return. So this would be the uh, the argument. Then I guess four o five b c two. Where is this? Oh. Four o five b c two. But that's like. Um, that's like down here. Why? Why is this? Are we storing the wrong offset? maybe um the find markers thing oh right yes okay this is also a mistake i've i made um i'm storing the location of so there are these four marker values and i'm storing the location of the first one but we should actually be storing the the location after after the markers and then here it should be storing the last okay but that's maybe not as important but anyway this part here um this offset here should be then plus four I guess. And this definitely creates another byte sequence. Still not uh, reasonable though, but this is something we could like double check. But this means that the whole debugging thing actually kind of works as long as we don't try to debug in the right place. So actually we should back up a little bit and just check when is the the setup table thing called for the first time and what's the value so we should break here so let's just delete this breakpoint oh not graph you we should go here we set the breakpoint we restart this thing we let it go to the entry point we do yes so shift f9 so it's running, enter ID, enter license key. And now the first thing passed here is the B3. Uh, and we recognize that because that is the, uh, uh, the location of the, uh, that we call into this verify license thing here that's a b3 so that makes sense all good uh so then i guess the other question is then what is this uh offset then um this value which is stored at this address go into the virtual machine here and then in the dump 
we should go to expression. Um, so this is 004017C9. And let's see what we are printing in our Uh, we should, of course, print those values as well. So let's just modify our code here and then do So it's the, um, we take the offset in the file. Uh, no, this is unrelated. We add this magic uh, start address here. Oh, we should just actually compare against this value. So we have 17C9, this is B9. Oh, right. Okay, sorry. Um, of course, so when I add four here, I should actually add four times four because each element is four bytes. So this would be um, 16. So actually, we should just do this. And now, Um, do a disassembly of this, which is something else. Okay, so now it says subtract. Okay, it's a different expression, but let's let's actually just go through this a little bit more. To now we can actually validate uh, our our code. We have a good way of doing this, so that's good. Yeah, thanks for the the tip, superhero. Um. Mm, And then of course, no, of course this should be changed then to C9. Uh, still not reasonable. But let's just look at this offset start B C9. So actually, if we go up here and we do not, we just make this an array of size four. And then here we have this data, which is at 17C9, which is offset BC9, which is what we print here. Okay, so that's that feels, feels pretty good. Um, but let's use the debugger to like further verify what we're doing. Um, so let's compare this again. We have BB3 passed as an argument. That's all good. And now we have uh, so this means that the first thing here, because this su should subtract uh, this uh, address here, or like round it down to, so this should be a C0, should be, or like 4017C0. Four, four oh, oh no, sorry, it's uh, divide by 10. So actually, what is this in decimal? It ends with a three. So uh, let's step and see uh, what's the first value that we pass here as the uh, um, argument to this function. 
so we just step down here and it's pushing 405 BAD and actually let's compare this to just like manually what we would expect so this uh, rounded down to the nearest 10 would be this uh, which is not what we are seeing so i'm i'm something is oh no no it's not the address we are running that we take the we take the offset we round it down and then we add this so that would be okay let's do this again we have this is the address we have so no okay i'm oh yeah of course i'm copying the wrong value 405 b a d um what was the argument we were uh looking at we had this entry point this entry point minus the okay so first of all the start marker is c9 here so we get this uh bb3 which is the virtual address we're looking at so we take the offset which is the virtual address minus the start marker whoa offset and then we look at this offset 86 so we can take this and round it down by doing this thing again 80 and then we add the start marker back and we get the 405 bad okay so that's good so then we just need to check is that actually what our code is doing so the first time we call get on marked function or unused function what is the seed value um It is, in fact, uh, the first thing we are uh, adding here. So that's good. That's good. That's uh, That means that we are doing the right thing. So now the question is, how many times uh, will we call this? So let's count this. It's called once, twice, three times, four, five, six, six times. Is this also reflected in what we are doing? So that would be the setup thing. So just like, hello. Uh, sorry, my, oh, my KVM switch messed up. Um, so just let, let's just, um, put in like a spacer here so it's one two three four five six seven that's not good um so maybe we this was actually supposed to be this so now it's six times and now we have something here so seven f or one that would be a some kind of but actually we can step this through now so now we it looks like we have the, the, the correct number of calls so let's go back to our debugger so this is very nice we're getting uh, getting closer here um we return from this 
let's check the corresponding thing here. We are here. Wait, where is this used? Decrypt. Oh, okay. It's, it's used to remember where we copied this thing. Um, so now we're going to decrypt some code. So now we can actually check the value of this so that the decryption uh, works correctly. So first of all, this is stored. Actually, we should go down to this function call, which is down here, I think. Let me verify this. 451, 451, yes. And the argument here is in the, it's pushed to the stack. So the argument here is 405 BB3. So let's go look at this in the dump here, and it should be 0863 and so on. And actually, let's just make sure that we are agree on this so that no other modification has been performed you know in some other place while we were not looking um so it says here at bb3 it's 86337 866337 okay so that's that that's all correct as well good um so now in so what we're doing here first of all we could actually just print out um, Uh, we should check that we are fetching the correct uh, value, actually. So here we could just print that the um, data at this offset, which corresponds to this virtual address, um is equal to this value here so if we run this and we should also probably do this as um hexadecimal yeah so we are fetching 86337 okay so we are addressing into the correct location and Actually, we could then um, also print out what we decrypt this value to. So let's print this out. The decrypted value as a hex value. Okay. So now we're just printing out that we are fetching this data at this offset, which is this virtual address, which is this value, and we're decrypting it into this 7F. Okay, so now if we go back into the debugger, uh, we can step it one step, and the decrypted value should be in the return value of this. So this gives us a 5.5, five, which is not the correct thing. So here we found a uh, discrepancy between our code and what's going on the debugger. And also, 5.5 five is a very good value uh, because that corresponds to, uh, I think it's like push, uh, is it push EBP? Um, yes, exactly. So um, hex 5.5 five is push EBP, which would be a very typical start of a function. So 5.5, five, much more reasonable than 7F that we decrypted this thing into. So, okay, so um this is good because we found something that's wrong and now we just have to correct this um i actually think that the easiest way now is to actually just restart the debugger and then go back to the same place Uh, 
Uh, oh, what did I do? Oh, actually, we should. Two, three, four, five, six, and then it's the end. And then we go back out here. And then we go here. So now we are again, we are. Oh, let me go back to this place in the we are here. So let's follow this. Um, we step into this. And now we are at here get on um, uh, unmarked function with the BB three as an argument, we step into this. We look at the corresponding thing here. We have this hash function. So now we can actually verify that the hash function is doing the right thing. It's getting um, 405 BB3 as the input value and it's returning. Oh, no, sorry. Now I stepped into it. Um, actually, just like let's step through. It did a rotate right. We can notice that. And then it returned four. So let's we could actually then add this as a test case then to our hash function so our hash function we should assert that the hash one of 405 bb3 should be four and we get an assertion error so our hash function is in fact um incorrect interesting so why why is it incorrect? Um, let's look at it again. So it's Taking this value, taking the handling count. Oh, no, wait. No, this is no, this is correct. It's taking this thing at this offset here, adding and then storing the handling count here. Um, so we should probably then, uh, so what did I say? It says B3. So we should be doing the rotation, right? Actually, let's actually, let's just step through and just compare at every step what it's doing. Um, so for that, uh, let's just put the breakpoint here, restart the debugger. Do this, pass the exceptions, do this, and then continue again. So now it's passing. Oh, sorry. I. Of course, I was using the wrong value as an argument. It's the BAD that should be. So let's check. Is this still an error? Yes, still an assertion error. Okay, so there's still a mistake here. Uh, checking the debugger, we step into this. Um, so the first thing it's taking the argument, it's just the last byte. This corresponds to what we're doing here. We're extracting this and then it's multiplying by this, uh, oh, value, this one, oh, one, oh, one which we're doing here and then it's adding this value 0d56 f28c 0d56 f28c yes that's correct and getting efo6d4 so actually let's do this let's print this thing here to just make sure that we are doing the same thing mm. 
Okay, do they have a different value? So we are not getting the same value here. We're getting EO4 instead of EFO. So this is this is incorrect. And that's actually very good because it could be just that this thing is wrong. Just this again. 405 BAD. Um, so let's, so this is the value we should be getting, the EFO. Now I'm a bit confused. Why or where is this incorrect? Did I copy this value incorrectly? 0D, 56, F2, 8C. Or is this, oh, is this used as a signed int? But wait, should that? Hmm, that shouldn't matter. Okay, uh, yeah. um, I mean, this is the this is the key to this whole thing. So we can't really just skip this over. Like, why is my calculation? Okay, let's let's back it up one step, actually. Let's restart this. I will I want to see the result of this uh, multiplication. Um So first we take AD, and we get this other value in EDX, and we multiply them, and we get AD, AD, AD. So AD, 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 okay, cool. And then, We just add this value here. And we get EFO sixty four. So is this is like a signed thing where we're because I mean we're not getting the same thing where we when we are adding and subtracting this, or sorry, adding this thing. So what would that be? That would be, uh, 
the E04, and we have there But it's too small. So wait, what's Yeah, I mean it doesn't matter if this is signed or unsigned, it would be the same value. Um any suggestions in chat why this Uh, what if we do it the other way around? What if we subtract this? What's this value? Um, sorry, from the target value. Copy this value. Subtract this. Well, this is a much smaller I'm very confused at the moment. Um, yeah, so it's a question. It's a constant, right? What does the debugger show for the value? Yeah, exactly. So this is the section where it's adding this value and we can follow this in this dump and we get this, which, I mean, well, it's little endian. So this would be um, 0D56F28C. And if you look in my code, wait, did I? First one is 0D, 0D, and then 56, 56, F2, F2, 8C, 8C. Okay, good. Um, and then, and also if we look at the result of this computation, like if we go the other way around, uh, so the, the result of the computation is this value. Uh, uh, EF06D4. So I'm wondering if there's like some kind of trickier with this addition instruction or something, but anyway. So this is the uh, result of the computation. Um, so, and if we instead go the other way around, we take this result and we subtract the other part here, which we have confirmed is correct, which was, would be this. We get this value instead. Actually, what is so it's it's like they added this value instead of adding the other value. So 
if we just like temporarily I mean this does this doesn't make sense at all of course but if we did this uh EFO 6D4 yeah so then we get the same the correct computation here like the right result if we change the constant to something that's not the correct constant um But anyway, and then we do the Hamming hum count of this, which will be D. Uh, let's actually print this as well. Uh, that's D, yes, correct. And then we check if this is even or odd. So we do a rotate right. These steps on this EFO 6D4. Um, and we rotate right that much. So let's let's print D three after we have um, rotated it. It's A six. Um, oh wait, it's. It's doing the rotation on just the last byte, and then, yeah, okay. And then it's doing an AND here to mask out the other stuff. Cool. So it's A6, which is what we also get. And then what's going on here? We take, um, ECX. Uh, move a 10 into there, we clear EDX, we do a division, we get the remainder, 6, right, I also input the wrong value in the assertion, so it should be 6 here. So... Uh, Antonio is asking, do you mind share the Python code after the stream? Uh, absolutely not. I will I will happily uh, share the code. Um, but it's returning a 6. Okay, so for this specific example, this constant works instead of this. And now we get the 55 here. Interesting. The question if I can put it on GitHub. Yes, I mean the crack me is already on on the uh, the crack me itself is already on 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 GitHub, and I think uh, Antonio will release the source code of the actual challenge. But I will release the I can absolutely publish my the code of of, of uh, my solution. Um, but okay, the good thing here is that we get the fifty five as a uh, decryption for this. Uh, the bad thing is that I have no idea why um, this works. So now the question is, does this work for the rest of the stuff as well? Um, that's very interesting. Um, but anyway, so we, it's, it seems like we have something that's correctly decrypting the stuff. Uh, so now we just need to, yeah, I told you sometimes when I have trouble with something, I just emulate it with unicorn and grab the result. 
yes, that's something I definitely would consider doing. But I'm a little bit confused why this calculation is not doing the right thing. But let's let's not care about that too much for now, because it seems that it was working. Uh, very strange, though. Um, so, because we get the the, the fifty five. Uh, thing here and actually the next two bytes are very reasonable as well so now we should just keep decrypting this um i guess let's see when we are about so every decryption is it's independent of any previous decryptions because it will do this setup of the table again so as long as we have the addresses and the lengths of the instructions we should be able to decrypt everything so we what we could do we could try to just We could start at the top and hope that it starts with an instruction and just decrypt those bytes, disassemble it with like um, a capstone, check the length of that instruction, increment our kind of like offset by the length of the first instruction, and then repeat this. So that would be a way to do this. Um, so first of all, Let's just get rid of all of this like debug output. Um, so now we should do the actual, like start decrypting stuff. And Yes, uh, we should get Python capstone. Right, so we do something like this. Uh, so capstone is a uh, disassembly framework and they have like Python bindings. So, um, uh, we create like an instance of this, and then now let's set this up uh, correctly. We don't need this at the moment, so we should do this like uh, decrypt. Uh, chunk and then we just give it a virtual address so then we do this thing we set up the function table and then we decrypt decrypt those bytes and then we return those bytes Uh, and then so we, what we want to do let's hope that this whole block starts with an instruction maybe it does maybe it doesn't but let's pretend, pretend it does so this is the first like uh, current virtual address is this and then we just continue until until we get down here to the uh, to the end here. So while the current virtual address is less than this, we can do this thing where we we decrypt a, a chunk, the current virtual address, and then we we disassemble this. 
and uh, we just pick the uh, instruction, just taking the next element from this, and then we can just print this. And first of all, just do a break there. Let's see if this works. That looks cool. So we have a push EBP at C9. Uh, now I just want to, there should be an attribute here, which <clears throat> tells me the length of this. Mm size hopefully size is one okay <clears throat> that sounds good so to the virtual address uh current virtual address we add the size of the instruction then uh first of all let's get rid of this debug output so now we're disassembling stuff here and this looks fine this is a bit strange but uh, i don't know it's not like it's not super clean but it it could be something so let's just start at the um uh, the uh, the entry point thing that we had. I just see what happens there. Hmm. So. It's looking a little bit strange. Um, like this thing, for example, doesn't really look correct. And this thing doesn't really look correct. So, uh, Mm. Also, like calling subtract on like ESP like this doesn't look quite correct. So it's like kind of good, but I think there's something that's a bit off. Um, but that's like it's not terrible. Maybe we should check. Um, A few more examples to see that it, that we're getting this correct. So in the debugger again, we would like to check in the decrypt byte thing here, this location. So. So now it's, yeah, PB3, we get 55, that's good. And then at BB4, we get 8B. Actually, we should put back our printout here and just run this. Um, All right, this will run for a bunch of bytes, even though the instruction is only one byte long. But it seems like it should give the same decryption. Okay, so let's go through this. So we gave 5, 5, 8, B, and then we should get EC and 8, 3. EC, 8, 3. And then 
ECFB83. EC04. Okay, so we have this thing is incorrect. Maybe the implementation of our um, one of these functions then is just incorrect. So let's actually print out. the function that we are using. And then actually just let's break there to so just get a short output. So the decryption 10 function. So we were getting correct stuff from five, eight, six, three, and seven, but number 10 is giving the incorrect output. Number 10 was this thing. So let's go to, we are taking Oh, it should not be a not here, actually. And now it's giving four. Good. So there was a, a mistake in one of the decryption function. But that's very uh it's very nice if we when we find a function like this and then we get after 04 we get um uh, 83 and then we should get ec3689 whoa uh, ec3689 and then e29410 65 instead of this. So decryption function two seems incorrect. Um, so what did we do there? Decryption two, we do the data plus 86. Um, interesting because that should be a very simple one let's look at the next one it's um we're getting fc instead of nine four so both of these are incorrect which is, it makes sense because it's the same function. So why? Actually, why is the same decryption function used twice? That doesn't make sense either. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So here each of the decryption functions are used once each. And then we refresh the table here, but something um something is wrong. So it's another mistake probably when we are refreshing the table here. Um, So we should probably check that code again. What happens when we do this? Hmm. 
Mm. Oh, this is just a... Uh... Uh, the problem here is that we're just overwriting the local variable here. Um, uh, without this will not propagate uh, properly. So what we should do here instead is actually um, Uh, so now that's correct, 6.5 and FC, that's good. And it was like, uh, sometimes showing costing in either decompletion, annoying other cases, so code cost. Might I suggest to add cost again? So was, was it in fact a costing thing with this? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, it doesn't seem to be an issue now. So now we're getting 6.5 FC, B9, 3.6, B9, 3.6, and then 0, and then we're done. Okay, so now a... Um, the uh, disassembly should be better. So now we have something that looks much more reasonable. And then This looks pretty nice. Some kind of uh, testing thing and then a return at the end. Looks very nice. So I wonder if we should, if we could just go back to the beginning there and just do the whole thing. Uh, looks kind of nice actually. So now we could just try to patch this into the program and uh, just disassemble it. Um, so we can do this by, first of all, costing the exe data um, into a byte array. And then, um, so we do this before here, and then for each of these, we want to get the offset, which is the magic star plus the magic, uh, magic. offset start so that's the offset and then we need to get the size and then so the exe data decrypted at uh, offset to offset plus the size of the instruction would be the first uh, part of the instruction so something like this and then we would do um A 
create a new exe and then we write the data there and then we just run this and now we open a new instance of ida so hopefully now if i didn't mess up uh, we should go to the uh, entry here or actually we should go to ooh, This is the address we should go to. This looks it looks a little bit strange, but it also kind of looks very correct. So this in instruction, I wonder if that's... Uh, so now the problem is that we have to do a little bit of, like redo a little bit of the, um, uh, some steps of the reversing. Basically we want to just Uh, we go back here. So this verify license thing, F3C is the call. Oh, no, no. Okay. It's here. So this is License ID pointer, license key pointer. License ID pointer, license key pointer. So this is the uh, what did I say? License ID pointer and then license key pointer. So what are we doing with these? <clears throat> okay, but let's just for a second, just pause to, to um, reflect on what we did here. Um, we actually, um, decrypted this, uh, this function here. Uh, using this, uh, we, we, were, we were able to reverse engineer the decryption function and then decrypt uh, the code. And this is this verify license uh, function, which is, it's taking these uh, two pointers and then it's doing some kind of trickery here. I wonder if this is actually related to the, uh, 
the other case in the exception handler. But let's uh, let's look look at the overall um, kind of um, structure here first. Um, so. We have some, what, what is this doing? It's, it's filling up some array with some kind of values here. Interesting. Uh, I'm not sure what that's doing. And this is doing this. Oh, okay. So okay, it what it, it looks like it's doing this. It's starting at the end of this buffer. And then it copies values from this uh, buffer, and every um, every nine uh, bytes, it's incrementing this index. So that would mean It copies like first nine Y's and then nine W's, nine O's and so on, but in the opposite order into this buffer. So this is like some kind of like uh, char array add one. And then it, the first one will be the first byte like byte in this pointer and then it starts doing these things and also we get this is like the license pointer and what is this thing okay so this is used in all of these other things yeah so i think this is gonna so if we start First of all, these are like misaligned. These are the four markers. And then we get a function here. Oh, this looks horrible. Um, but it also kind of looks, I mean, it looks horrible, but it also kind of looks like we did the correct decryption so that's like it's good so let's see how many of these let's just create functions out of these i wonder if this is going to have to go to uh, a part three that would be unfortunate we've been going on for almost three hours now um but yeah, still uh, a bunch of you here. So that's that's very nice. Um, let's let's see if we can find like the overall structure at least of what's going on. I I think that these in instructions is somehow interacting with that other uh, branch of the uh, exception handler, uh, which is then creating some kind of uh, interesting uh, control flow. Uh, that would be my my guess, my kind of like gut feeling uh, for this. Um, so and 
and these are like all in the same format. Which is also very interesting. But also kind of uh, some indicator that, you know, the decryption was hopefully correct. And you see some kind of these magic values here in the beginning of each function. So that's probably the difference uh, between them. So I'm just like going through these functions, going to the beginning and like telling uh, Ida that these are functions. So Ida is not able to identify this, that this is a function because there's, there are no calls to them because I think we have some of this like indirect uh, control flow uh, trickery going on uh, with the exception handler. That's that's what I'm guessing. Um, so I'm... Oh, and here is a different function doing some, oh, some like XMM instructions and stuff. And then a few other, no, I think that was the last one. Yeah. Okay, so this is very nice. We see here that it says like SATA code, like Satan code or something. Um, so that's also, that's also nice. Okay, I think. Actually, this might be the driver behind this. So we have MMIO install IO proc. Oh, okay. So this is probably. What would drive this? Let's first of all, let's look at the documentation here. Um, this function installs or removes a custom IO procedure. This function also locates an installed IO procedure using its corresponding four character code. So the first, Argument is the four character code. This is probably going to be say, yeah, okay, S A T, lead speak. And then the proc is here. Um, so, okay, this is indexing into this huge table. Here, that's interesting. Okay, uh, not quite sure yet where this is going, but let's see where we have those. Uh... Um, where is the start of this, uh, like encrypted code? Start is here. Okay. So this is like, I just want to know where they are so we can easily find them here. And then we see that these functions are all of this same structure. So is this going to be like another layer of like the same style of uh, 
decryption or that would be terribly nasty um yeah i mean it's let's see how many of them there are so we have 13 of these 14 could it be like exactly 16 of them nope there are more okay so 18 of these functions and then we have okay and then like a 19 of the same style and then we have like a different style of function here and here and then the verify license thing so these are all the like in encrypted functions so what's the highest value here it's 21 I was thinking like these could like correspond to those functions or something, but yeah. So let's look at the x86 in instruction. Uh, hmm, I wonder if we could just Google these two things together. Oh, and you Google it and you get to um, stuff about malware. So uh, yeah, that's always interesting. But so I, what I'm thinking is that you have this like IO uh, proc here, which will then be like triggered somehow by these in instructions um but i guess this we need to look at the um mmoi infrastructure do we have this in ida already Wait, why is this? Hmm. Okay. Maybe disk offset. Uh, not completely sure, but this could be this thing that's so this is like checking that the offset is within this range and then indexing into this so we're kind of creating some kind of like virtual kind of virtual disk or something here uh by by using this so this would be like the disk size or something. Um, so this does this correspond to um, this is like the G disk, which is um, so this value is this much and maximum possible size right that does kind of look correct oh, okay so this is this whole thing here all the way And then we have some value here, which is used for something else. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh.
So basically what this thing is that in certain like input output operations, so basically when we're trying to do some kind of disk read, this like hook function will be called instead. Check that the disk offset is fine. Okay, there's like different types of uh, IO messages then, I guess, as well. So, but in, uh, in the case of message zero, which probably, possibly could be a read, it's like copying stuff from this offset. So this would be the size of the copy. And then this would be probably the destination in this case and returning this. Um, and this is some kind of flag. This is like a reset. Uh, or something, it's setting the disk offset. Not sure what it's doing, but maybe it's not, maybe it's not terribly important. Um, so the question is just like, when is this triggered and what is all of this data? Um, So, Okay, so this is also the. I, I'm now looking again at the like verify licensing. Where could this be the size of the license key? Let's just check. So we get some kind of value back from the read license key thing. Kind of looks like it could be. Like it just could be the number of characters. Yeah, so this could be just the size of the license key. Um, um, not completely sure. So basically, It will first set up this uh, buffer here, which we don't really know what it's doing. And then it will check that the, uh, it will copy like one byte from the license ID. And then we will do these things with this in byte stuff, which probably corresponds to these disk reads. So let's check here. Um, copies the values from the IO port specified with the second operand as the copies the values from the IO port specified with the second. Okay, so we specified with the second operand to the destination port. The source operand can be a byte immediate. Okay. Um, So what is this? Whew. Yeah, this is some stuff that I haven't really worked with that much before. I'm I'm thinking that this would be a good place to actually take a break. So what we basically have done so far is we managed to decrypt this uh, this code, and then we have this function which is using um these in instructions and i 
I think so these should be somehow related to these other functions here. So I think they are, because all of these have this similar structure here. And you see all of them, there is some actual, there was some of these magic values that I didn't really see in the decompilation. So there's, so what's like this? Oh, okay, so the decompilation here is not really correct either. That's annoying. Um, oh, wait, here is a, this looks like an address of a function. Almost, but not quite. No, okay, it's just four, five, six, seven. Okay. All right, my mistake. Yeah. Uh, and then we have this function, which is using some very interesting. instructions what are these actually um packed yeah okay you would have to go through these and like look what it's doing but it's a bunch of different operations on like xmm registers and this, however, could be very interesting because this is I was thinking that this could correspond to the various different functions we have. Seems to be no real. Hmm. So Actually, let's go back and check this other branch of this uh, handler. Uh, which was this thing that we looked at, at uh, looked at some play, uh, at some point we looked at this where mm. Right, so when this type of ex exception code happens, we will look at the uh, byte after the current, after the byte after the instruction pointer, and use this as an index into this table where we have. Could these be the addresses of those instructions here then? Actually, that's uh, very interesting. Uh, so here we have a bit of a mismatch. This should start at CEE. -E. So we have to undefine this stuff. Then here. Oh. Look, yes, so this table, oh, this was a function we missed as well. Okay, yeah, so I see what's going on here. Um, so we have this table of 21 different functions which are all of these decrypted functions. So I would guess that if we look at these uh, in instructions, the way these are, uh, what they look like in memory is, yes, there are two bytes. So the E4 is just irrelevant here. 
uh, so the in part is completely relevant and it doesn't have to do anything about this memory thing. It will just trigger one of these exceptions, which will go into this function, which will kind of like, so it's this kind of like pseudo function call to control the control flow. So what will happen is that, let's say we can take this as a first example. Um, this thing here will call function zero in this table. Uh, let's go to this table again. So it will call this function, which will do all of this and uh, and return. And then I should actually open another Um, if we go back to the table and then I have in the verify licensing, uh, so it will call that function. So we could even, uh, oh, well, and then it will call this function, which is index two in this table, which is this one. which will, oh, it will use the same mechanism and so on. So with this one here, we'll call the first function in the table, which is this one. Uh, so we will get some, some value here and, and so on. So this kind of like drives the control flow throughout this whole uh, section. Oof. So I think, like a good way to analyze this would be to just patch the binary so that all of these in things are replaced by function calls. But the problem is how big is a relative, because these instructions, um, these instructions take up uh, two bytes. So if we want to like patch it so that it looks nice, we will have to, we need two bytes uh, replacement. Uh, so we need to find, we need to have a jump function that's just two bytes. Uh, but that's, uh, we can probably do with like a relative jump. Uh, uh, can we get like a reference thing here? Yes, exactly. So we can do... Oh, we can do this as a short relative jump. Um, that's probably not going to be enough. So I'm wondering how we can like set this up to, to look really nice in the in the decompiler because these functions, they exist over a span of, it's from like 401, actually we can look here, start it's from 401 to all the way here to like 405. Yeah, so this is like over, there's a quite a lot of stuff, but I guess we could, if we could place, no, it's definitely not enough. Okay, maybe there's a different way of, of sorting it, but but yes, this is the basically the issue, the the thing that's going on here. These in instructions are abused through this uh, exception handler to create kind of like a fake uh, function call uh, system where it will 
fetch the real address of the function from this table using the index, using the the the, the in the argument to the in fun, uh, uh, instruction, and then it will set the stack pointer uh, no sorry it will right it will uh decrement the stack pointer yeah so it will just add the return it will kind of set up it is set it up as a fake function call by adding a not another um, address the return address to the top of the stack so it will update the stack pointer it will set the return address to the instruction right after this uh, in instruction and then it will return execution to that uh, point um yeah so as i said uh, this thing here is like a fake function call to the first element in this table which we have here which is very interesting. And by the way, these should be those four control values. Then, oh, this is another value actually. So this should be, twenty two elements in the array. Um, yeah, so the easiest way to analyze this would be to like, let the decompiler do the heavy lifting by somehow replacing these, uh, instructions with the proper function calls and then like reanalyze this, uh, and, and to, to recover the control flow. The tricky part is that we need a function call, which is just two bytes because otherwise we do have to like expand the size of the function, which could create a lot of other issues if there are other like relative references and stuff. So, um, yeah, need to think about how to, to do that in a, in a good way. But I think this is actually, as I said, I think it's a good way to uh, stop for now. Actually, we can do one last thing. We could check where is this um, this constant that we uh, were wondering about before. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, we're getting some nice commentary in the chat here, by the way, by the, the challenge author. So I definitely should think you should check this out. So either pro decompiler versus nanomites protection. Yeah. Oh, is this what this is technique is called? I think I've heard that name. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, nanomites is powerful anti-dumping technique, replacing certain branch instruction with int uh, three, remove dump instructions are placed in a table. Um, right. Yeah, so the, I mean that the, they are describing here a variant, but it's the same it's the same idea. So you replace the real control flow with something that you can catch uh, in, in like a debugger or, or something. And then you like restore the control flow uh, and, and then you let it run. Um, yeah, so uh, before we finish, like are there any uh, 
are there any like questions or, or uh, comments or anything from anyone uh, listening so far? So unfortunately, there will be there will have to be a, a part three of this since uh, I didn't manage to solve it uh, here as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, I like really like this challenge uh, so far. It's, um, using some really nice tricks. I really think there are some some things I I, I really see some potential for for improvement for my for myself. Uh, some of these things I could have done faster. Also, I did some. If I would have gotten the debugging to work uh, earlier, that should probably would probably have saved me a lot of time as well. But uh, yeah, I hope this is you find this useful uh, and you can get some takeaways uh, from some of the workflow uh, I'm using here. Um, so the next step here would then be to kind of like recover the control flow and then understand what all of these functions are doing and then from there kind of like recover what the um how this license check works so what i'm still a bit worried about is of course this whole um this big like virtual disk thing which takes up like the vast majority um, of of of, uh, of the file. So so we have a comment here from Superhero. I have a hard time following. Yeah, um, I should probably have some kind of like visual aid for this. Um, it's. Uh, it's a bit tricky. I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, I'm trying to really like guide you through my my thoughts and, and and what I'm doing, but of course, it's a bit difficult to be able to like convey all the stuff I'm I'm, I'm thinking about. But um, so feel free to you know, or like actually, I really encourage you to like ask uh, questions about specifics, like why I did certain things or not. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I mean, the the whole idea of this is that you should should get some kind of like some takeaway from this. Um, but yeah, with that said, I think uh, we are done for today. I will try to like schedule a, a third session. I guess um, that will happen maybe like later in the week. I don't know, Wednesday, Thursday, something like that, maybe. And uh, well, hopefully, I will be able to to solve it uh, then. So. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, tuning in and uh, see you.